Well, I think this has become a tradition. If you do it twice, it's a tradition, right? Uh, for me to share, uh, if I learned anything at the Answers in Genesis Pastors and Leaders Conference, uh, I was mentioning to the men yesterday that uh, I mean, last year and this year and then looking at next year, the themes are all similar, uh, but why would they not? Uh, it's all about you know, having a biblical worldview, the authority of scripture, um, and so it's, it's really good stuff. As they put it, it's a no fluff conference. So there's, it's, uh, and, and when you're dealing with a little bit of jet lag, it's a little hard to stay awake sometimes. Um, so apparently some of you flew in this morning. Uh, <laughs> so why do I go to this? Well, because you let me, so thank you. Um, but Answers in Genesis is a solid uh, organization. And yeah, their title, of course, says what their emphasis is. And obviously, the, they're known for the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. But all of it get down, gets down to biblical authority. And so not everything that they cover in the conference is about creationism per se, but it is about scripture and about what it means to us, what it means to us, not just individually, but as a church and how we should be, uh, we need to be diligent in studying God's word, knowing his word, applying his word, so that we can spot error. There is a lot of error. We should not be surprised because if we've read this thing at all, it tells us. If I read it from the message, it says there will be morons in future days. Um, but that's, we know that there are false teachers. There were false teachers 2,000 years ago. They still are here, and there will be more. Here's one of them. I have no problem uh, calling out somebody. You've, we've called him out before, Bill Johnson. But check out this mishmash. Uh, God is in charge, but he is not in control. He has left us in control. Huh? Now, Bill Johnson has a huge church, Bethel Church, in Redding, California. Remember, if you don't remember, you guys all, do you know who he is? Most of you know who he is? So this is the guy, remember, that uh, he and his wife have, have promoted grave soaking. It's called sometimes grave sucking or mantle passing, where they lay on the tombstones of dead uh, Christian greats, and the idea is, remember when Elijah passes the mantle to Elisha, they interpret that as, oh, you can kind of get a, a, head, a head start, you can get a leg up on your spiritual legacy. So uh, I don't, C.S. Lewis, they seem to like laying on his grave, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, who look him up, he was a nut job and a half. Um, but where do they get this stuff from? Well, they get it from uh, not understanding Scripture accurately, and then the thousands of people who follow them and buy their music uh, either don't know what they believe, don't know what they personally believe or what they ought to believe, or they don't care. All of them are dangerous. So why are we in the mess that we are today? It's not the wicked that are causing the issues. It's the church. It's us. We are to, to be the salt and the light. So anyway, so it's, let me give you another word salad. Uh, this isn't really, that's not so much a word salad. It's just heresy. But um, see if you can tell me what this means. This is from Bill Johnson as well. Words attract presence, and you and I determine what kind of presence we want to attract. Sometimes we create landmines to our destiny through our own words. I'm not sure I know what he means there. I think what he's getting at is, you know, what it's sort of that name it and claim it, blab it and glab it, blab it and grab it, that kind of whole idea that if I speak it into existence, then it will happen. That's not, is that scriptural? Yeah, no. Now, there's something to be said about the things that we say. Words do matter. If you think you are 
stupid, then if you think that way, then you're likely going to act that way. So instead, we need to have a different mindset because what does, who cares what somebody else says about you? I mean, words hurt, they can wound, they can be with us for a lifetime, but really when it gets down to it, whose description of us matters? God's. And that should remind us of who we are in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. And if we have a grasp of our, our identity in Christ, it solves a whole lot of problems, does it not? All right, so there's the sermon for today. That was short. So, well, let's see. Uh, I woke up at 5 a.m. Pacific time and uh, Anna very graciously uh, took me to the airport. I feel it wasn't as much her being kind-hearted, but her wanting to get me out of the state. Um, she was driving awfully fast. No, I didn't feel unsafe for one moment. It was many moments. Um, no, 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 we, we made it okay. Um, some of the other cars didn't, but there's the, thankfully, she did not have a Hummer. Um, this is the beautiful Cincinnati airport located in Kentucky. Um, <laughs> in fact, the, the formal name, it's in the background there, Cincinnati slash Northern Kentucky International Airport. Um, there is a Louisville airport, but uh, if you ever have to fly into Louisville, uh, go into Cincinnati. It's, it's a lot easier. There's direct flights where there are not typically into Louisville. Uh, Louisville's a very small, nice airport. It's not a bad airport. It's, it's just not that great. Plus, the traffic is horrible in Louisville because there's horses everywhere. Um, there's Kentucky. It's an odd state. Uh, it's considered the southernmost northern state and the northernmost southern state. Uh, it got hammered during the Civil War because you had Ohio solidly part of the Union to the north. Uh, the Underground Railroad went through Kentucky, slaves trying to get into uh, Ohio and then eventually into Canada. Um, so there's a little, whoop. I was mostly in northern Kentucky. Uh, so. If you remember the Covington, uh, the guys that got that whole controversy a few years back with the uh, boys from the school, the Catholic school, and, and the American Indian individual, and they were accused of being racist, that's, that's where Covington is. Um, I'll uh, get back to Covington in a bit. CVG, that's the name of the airport. Uh, Florence, Kentucky is where I stayed. You can see Louisville is down there. And LaGrange is where my, uh, my family live. Um, so they're outside of, of Kentucky. Of course, I needed to experience local culture. This is actually a picture from a year ago at a restaurant called Smokin' This and That Barbecue. <laughs> and as I've mentioned, if that were the name of a restaurant in downtown Seattle, pulled pork might not be on the menu, but <laughs> something else might be. Um, so I went back there again and uh, ordered something completely, uh, completely different. <laughs> I ordered the same thing, and I, I don't know how it was even possible. It was even better. If, if you like pulled pork with the slaw on top, mac and cheese, oh. The other thing I like about this restaurant, I didn't put any pictures in here, but they're very pro-military and law enforcement. They have memorabilia. This is, you know you're in Kentucky when there are actually actual weapons on display, there's swords. I mean, a kid could lop their fingers off, but you know, kids in Kentucky know not to do that. Out here, we're not sure. It's like, ooh, something shiny. Um, Anyway, that food was fantastic. So this is all part of the ministry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so the actual conference started Tuesday morning at the Ark Encounter. It's actually at what they call the Answers Center. And uh, it's, a, as you can see, a very large uh, auditorium. No frills. Um, I appreciate that about Answers in Genesis. They invest, I think, their money wisely. Uh, Michael O'Brien, like last year, did a lot of the worship. He used to be with a Christian group called New Song. 
and um, I like him because he does a really great job. It's very balanced, so it's some more modern uh, songs, but it's also classic hymns. The very first thing, and I thought of Linda Mitchell, the very first song we sang was Wonderful, Merciful Savior, and when you have over 2,000 people singing that, if it doesn't, if you don't have goosebumps, then you're dead. Go have some pulled pork. So Ken Ham was the first speaker. No big surprise. Ken, you, you, it's interesting. He, he always, always in the past has bookended the conference. He opens, he closes. This year he opened, but he was not the final speaker. It was Martin Isles. And um, so some of you have heard about him, we'll talk about him a little bit more later. And I think there's a reason why Martin was the closing speaker. So, um, Six days contending for a biblical worldview. If you've ever heard Ken Ham and you go hear him, you're going to hear the same stuff, a lot of the same material. But it's good review, and then there's always something new and something different. He's very passionate about what he believes, and so, um, so what I've tried to do is just give some highlights from each of the folks. They actually give every participant a really nice uh, book here. It's got a lot of, you know, promotional stuff in it, but. It tells you about the speakers. It gives you a, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a place for notes. If you know anything about me, you can see there's doodles on there as well. Um, I'm one of those people because that's how I keep my ADHD under control. Um, ooh, hi. Um, so one of his main points was that all worldviews have the same problem, and that is they have the wrong foundation. And that's why we try to focus here on a biblical worldview. It makes a huge difference, does it not? If you start with scripture in how you view life versus, you know, I was talking with someone the other day and they said, you know, I really know a lot about philosophy. It's like, great, actually not great because philosophy isn't how God views life. Philosophy is how we view life. And in Colossians, do you remember our study in Colossians? What did Paul say about philosophy? It's like, uh, no, pick Christ. <laughs> Not philosophy, Christ. So making sure we have the wrong, or excuse me, the correct foundation. Um, I think I mentioned this verse last week, but Proverbs 35 and 6, every word of God proves true. I mean, that seems so obvious, but when we think about it, I mean, have you ever looked at a passage of Scripture, you hear somebody preaching on it or teaching on a particular passage, and you think, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that, or I'm not sure what that means, or I don't know how that's going to work out. But this is a really great promise that every God of Word proves true. When we put our faith and trust in His Word, He's not going to steer us in a wrong direction, then it's going to turn out for the best. It's going to turn out to be true. How many people over centuries have tried to disprove Scripture and then, surprise, um, it's proven time and time again. Uh, we mentioned this uh, Wednesday morning Bible study how uh, for many, many years people attacked the book of Daniel because of the, the narrative of Belshazzar and there was no, they could find no archaeological evidence that this dude existed. Plus, he's referred to as the king um, in uh, the book of Daniel and again, no evidence that he was the king. But we get some clues, don't we, as to who he was and that it was, um, and, and biblical terms can throw us off because the word brother doesn't always mean that it's a biological brother. Remember, Paul calls Timothy a son, and yet there was no biological connection there. It was a spiritual connection. So similar thing with Belshazzar is, talks about either his uncle or grandfather was the actual king, but was smart and got out of Babylon knowing what was coming. Um, um, so Belshazzar is sitting there and just kind of given up because he's, the city is under siege and that's when he has his party and grabs the temple ware that had been taken. Who had taken all the temple ware? Nebuchadnezzar had, right? Um, Belshazzar apparently forgot the lessons of Nebuchadnezzar and what God <laughs> had him go through to get his attention. Um, 
But we get clues. We get a clue in how Belshazzar could be in charge but not, uh, not the king. When Remember when uh, 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 Belshazzar's, uh, I always space on it, his mom or his grandmother? His grandmother um, says, hey, you want to interpret this stuff? All of your experts, they're the so-called wise men, they're not going to be able to do it. Get Daniel. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. Get him. So they bring Daniel to the court. Um, and what does Belshazzar promise him? The third spot in the kingdom. So why, why number three? Because number two wasn't available. Belshazzar was number two. And the other, the king king, what's his name, James? Nabonidus. No. Baby boy names. <laughs> you can call him Dus for short. No. Um, so he's the king, Belshazzar's second. That's why he could only offer the third in the kingdom. So we get these little clues. All right, that was a rabbit trail. But God's word proves true. What did they find? Was that what, in the 80s or 90s? I think 90s, not that long ago, they found evidence that a Belshazzar did exist and that he was like a regent or was in charge. Um, so look, God's word will always prove to be true. And notice this wonderful promise that goes with it. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. We have a culture, we have a society, we have a church that is taking refuge in all the wrong things. And they wonder why life isn't going well. Well, here you go. So know his word, study his word, apply his word, stick with his word, put your faith and trust in him, and he is a shield. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Uh, Ken says this often, that really what he sees in culture, it's not, uh, oh, when, when talking about the six days, whether it's literal, 24-hour periods of time, he acknowledges it's not a salvation issue. If you believe in millions of years, uh, that doesn't mean you're going to hell. Um, it might. Uh, no, we'll, we'll get into that in, um, when do we get into the six days? Pretty soon, when we resume uh, in Genesis. But it's an authority issue the authority of God's word. And if God says it, then we need to start there. Not start with science or philosophy or any person's opinion and then try to figure out how scripture does or doesn't fit. Wrong way to do it. So again, what is, what is our starting point? Um, he talked a lot about observational versus historical science. Um, some of these things I'm not gonna get into today, one, because it's just a summary, and two, because we'll get into them as we go through Genesis. How interesting that I went to an Answers in Genesis conference right before we're going through Genesis. There's a little crowd shot, um, stage shot. You can see a little tiny blop in the uh, right hand, middle, center. But that gives you an idea of that, that whole, I love, it would be lovely to have that here, Marty. Uh, are you envious? That whole back is, I mean, that's a, a mo you know, a big video screen. So um, it's, it's pretty cool. The next speaker was Emil. He goes by EZ, which I think is kind of, those are his initials, so why not? Um, he was born in Lebanon. Now this is on Tuesday, so this is before all the, craziness broke out, uh, the atrocities that uh, were carried out against Israel. Um, but uh, an interesting, you know, he talked about, uh, you know, he, he came to Christ later in, in life, um, but it's interesting that his topic was not even fearing fear itself. But he talked about how people looked at him and treated him post 9-11. <laughs> you know, being an Arab American and, and how uh, he had some interesting conversations with, with individuals. He said that, uh, and it depends on which translation, but there are about 365 fear knots that you can find in scripture. I don't think that's an accident that God is reminding us, hmm, once a day, <laughs> not to fear. 
we know 2 Timothy tells 1 7 says that we're not to have a spirit of fear. Some translations say timidity. And, uh, but fear, uh, as Emil pointed out, focuses on self rather than God's power and providence. And again, it's the wrong starting point. If we start with I feel fill in the blank versus God says, you know, it, it makes a big difference in how we approach life. Here's the second Timothy passage. For this reason, Paul talking to young Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit of fear, excuse me, but God, whoops, going Bill Johnson here. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Think of the benefits of of trusting in God, in trusting in what he has gifted us to do. Um, a little bit more about uh, Emil Zwayne. He is the president of an organization called Living Waters. Some of you may have seen or heard of the movies The Atheist Delusion, 180, which I believe 180 is in the church library, um, and Evolution versus God. So he uh, was executive producer. He also uh, participates in the Way of the Master television program, and he's the co-host of the National Bible Bee game show, as well as their spokesman. So interesting stuff. Uh, Mark Spence is also with Living Waters and um, his, to his topic was don't water down the gospel. A pretty, it was a, a, a simple message that he had, but a good one, you know, that we do need to trust in his word. Um, I don't know who, this is not his phrase, but uh, so I don't know who the attribution should go to, but when we have people, you know, a lot of people are seeking an experience with God um, and they want to feel a certain way but you know that's going to lead us astray because feelings will betray us. Feelings change. Feelings as we know are based on external circumstances whereas the joy of the Lord is based on an internal circumstance that we have Christ the living Savior uh, as our Lord and so you have people saying, you know, any, here's a big, huge red flag. If somebody starts off by saying, well, God told me, it's like, uh, how many of you have, have seen, um, uh, he posts on Facebook, uh, his site, it's called the Holy Nope, N-O-P-E. Anyone? So this guy, um, he's, he's very conservative, uh, theologically I might, might not agree with him on a couple of things, but what he'll do is he'll play a clip um, of a heretical speaker, there's no shortage of them, sadly, and uh, oh, see, I don't like not being able to see you guys. I'm going to try to get my glasses fixed this week, because I really, I can't see you when I do that. <laughs> um, but he starts off by, you see him, I guess, in his living room saying, you know, I've got my Bible, I'm ready to, you know, learn God's Word, and he goes out the door, and then he shows the clip, and then sometimes it's short, sometimes it's a little bit longer, and then he'll go, nope, um, after they do something heretical, and people will say things, you know, well, Jesus told me to tell you. No, he didn't. You were sniffing paint fumes again. And it's not that God doesn't speak to us, but how does God speak to us? His Through His Word. How do we know that? Because His Word tells us that. You know, look at the beginning of Hebrews, right? God spoke by his prophets in time past, but now he speaks through Jesus Christ, through his word, through the word. So, I like this quote here. Don't wait for a voice when you have a verse. Well, God, you haven't said anything to me. Have you cracked this open? You know, it's all here, right? Everything we need to know. I mean, it's kind of cheesy, the whole people turn Bible into an acronym. So it's corny, but basic instructions before leaving Earth. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but this, this is our guidebook. 
and it's not just a it's not just an owner's manual um, it's God's heart it's God's word and so it's it's true we can trust it um, it doesn't have to be modified updated forgot to actually announce this but um, so this is a good thing for everybody in the building to know. Uh, there, this is a sheet of emergency information on one side and additional resources, uh, you know, because we've had situations where, and, and I don't know, we don't have a date yet, but we are gonna do like an emergency drill or fire drill kind of thing, not making you walk out into the parking lot unless we don't like you, then we might do that, <laughs> especially if it's raining. Um, but what do you do if this concrete building catches on fire? Um, or we've had, oh, I don't know, I don't wanna point, single anyone out, but let's see, Morgan, you were standing, it was about here? Kathy was about there, and Morgan really loves Kathy and wanted to give her a hug, apparently. But anyway, he passed out and toppled over in the middle of singing. Um, were we singing, or? We were singing. What were we singing? Song, song, song. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we were in verse two. You believe we were in verse two of any? I just read the, or I was, supposed to read the scripture and I just missed my cue on that. Then, yeah, you missed your cue all right, but you didn't miss Kathy. <laughs> and we started singing, we got into verse two and I just... Apparently it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yep. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've had people call 911 and they don't know the church's address, street address. How many of you have it memorized? 19010 Fifth Avenue Northeast. Nerds of the world unite. But maybe you don't have that memorized, so guess what? It's, it's here. Did you know we have these sheets? So, they are located underneath the AED. Did you know we have an AED? There it is, mounted on the wall. Um, there's a first aid kit underneath there. There's also one of these sheets in the church office, right by the phone. There is a phone. See where Mike Pitchford is? He's our f operator. So, call him 24-7. Anyway, uh, there's a phone in the coat room and another one of these, so, but these have been uh, updated. God's word does not need to be updated. This did, why? Because some of the information was outdated. Isn't it fascinating? I mean, God's word needs no updates. It requires no revisions. Uh, so when people say, oh, the Lord told me, it's like, hmm. It's usually Wednesday morning after Taco Tuesday when people have those revelations but don't wait for a voice when you have a verse. We have God's word. It's an amazing gift. He quoted Galatians 3.24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So we know what the law was for. Uh, Christ, when he came, what did he do with the law? He fulfilled it. He specifically said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. So in preparation for the next speaker, this was kind of, this was interesting. They put on red lights and, and um, this was preparing for uh, Martin Isles. I don't really like taking pictures while somebody is speaking, so that's why I didn't take a lot of those pictures. So this is before it started, but uh, Philip Webb and the Masters University, uh, he's a tenor. Now that's an imposing looking guy. Um, so he has been the worship leader at Grace Community Church, which is John MacArthur's church, for 30 some odd years. And um, he's an accomplished uh, operatic tenor. And my least favorite voice to listen to is an operatic tenor. Um, but he was really good and didn't make me want to peel my skin off. So. Um, and then you can, uh, lower left, you can see there's a group of, of young people from the Master's Seminary, Master's University, and uh, so mainly strings, just phenomenal as they were 
uh, playing and introducing Martin Isles. The way Martin introduced his living in Babylon, and you can see that's what's on the screen there, um, is they had a video and it was narration and I've never heard anyone read this much scripture as an opening, but it was the entire fifth chapter of the book of Daniel, which is the story of Belshazzar and the writing on the wall. And so Martin was talking about, uh, we had a sermon not ah, a few years back when uh, we talked about that we are in a Babylon society, we are in exile because we are not the, minor, uh, the majority of the population. We don't sway culture like we used to. And, um, but a few basic reminders that our hope is not in politics. Martin Isles, um, he, was, he spoke there last year. Uh, he's from Australia and he is an attorney. He headed up a group similar to the Alliance Defending Freedom, you know, that kind of a group, and uh, but sort of the Australian version. Australia is far more secular than we are. Um, which is hard to believe, but, and Martin said he thinks Australia is probably about 10 to 15 years ahead of us, you know, because we're just following right along. Um, and uh, so, but Answers in Genesis was so impressed with him last year. He's the only speaker last year that got a standing ovation um, that they hired him. <laughs> so he's now their chief ministry officer. And uh, Ken, in the last message he had for the conference, called him the future of Answers in Genesis. I think that was a not so thinly veiled announcement that they're, they're grooming him to be the next head of the ministry. He's relatively young, he's in his late 30s. He's relatively tall, he's 6'7", and he's relatively white because he's Australian. And he's a ginger, so. But a reminder that we shouldn't place our trust in a system of man-made power structures that actively oppose God. Why would we do that? And you might think, well, I don't do that, really. <laughs> How many, and maybe we were guilty at times, but through the whole pandemic, you know, did we, did we trust people over God's principles? I don't know, that's between you and, and the Lord. Uh, but he pointed out the characteristics of Babylon. Not Babylon necessarily from centuries ago, but today. Um, in fact, remember in the Bible, the word Babylon refers to different things. Sometimes it's referring to Rome. Um, so do any of these characteristics sound familiar in our culture today? Pride, making oneself great. That reminds me, I wanted to get a selfie with uh, Morgan. I mean, is there anything wrong with selfies? Not really. Um, did millennials invent selfies? No, they've been around for a long time, but it's become so much part of our culture to, you know, it's all about me. And if you take an exorbitant amount of selfies, you may not get to heaven. And if you pose with duck lips, you're definitely not <laughs> going to heaven. By the way, that's not true, necessarily. Rebellion, which is still about self, right? Because we're worshiping us. When did this, when did these sins start? The, the 60s? Yeah, the Garden of Eden, right? Pride even before the Garden of Eden, because what was Lucifer's issue? He invented the selfie, and he's not going to heaven. So I'll just, just extrapolate there. Might be misapplication. <laughs> Rebellion, worshiping self. Now this one is interesting, and we'll flesh it out at another time. Uh, so if you struggle with this, don't think you're a horrible person. But some of the anxieties that we have because we're anxious, why? Because we are trusting something more than we're trusting God. Now, there's uh, chemical reasons and hormonal imbalances that can feed into those things, but as a, you understand what I'm saying? As a general principle, we have a culture that is very anxious 
But why are they anxious? Because they're not trusting God. We don't even believe in God as a culture. Oh, your God is your, that's fine for you. You believe whatever you want. The other, the final characteristic that he points out, this one's very sobering, is what happened to Babylon? It ended. It collapsed. We're, will the United States collapse at some point? Probably. <laughs> Why, this is, goes into eschatology, why is the United States, now Seventh-day Adventists argue that America is mentioned in biblical prophecy, and I don't see that anywhere. Um, so if America is not mentioned in prophecy, and I don't believe it is directly, why is it not mentioned? What would be the couple of reasons? Well, yeah, they stopped supporting Israel, for sure. Why else would the U.S. not be mentioned in prophecy, Brian? Because they turned their face away from God. They turned their face away from God, and so they are either impotent, which we're becoming more impotent as a country, as far as our godly influence or Christian influence that we've had for since our inception. Um, so we've either been eliminated by a foreign power so we don't exist, or we are so weak that we're not important. Either, I think, are very possible. We're certainly, on the impotent side, we're certainly hurtling towards that. That's depressing. But can things change? Absolutely. Do you really believe that? Can there be true revival in the United States? Yeah, there can. We don't know what God's you know, future plan is for the United States, but we do know what his plan is for us in the present. And that's to be, a, be the salt, be the light, to proclaim his word, to know what his word is, and to stand firm in the faith. We know this, why? Because we've read the Bible. All of you have read the Bible. Everyone here read the Bible? At least the table of contents to start. So, a couple of thing, other things about Babylon, that Babylon persecutes as well as it seduces. Think of the craziness in our culture, and you're persecuted if you disagree. You're called a bigot, you're intolerant, put a phobe after it. You're a homophobe, you're a transphobe, you're whatever, a phobe-phobe. Um, but it also seduces. So it kind of is a, just two-pronged. It's like I'm going to attack you for what you believe and try to minimize who you are. Um, but if that doesn't work, then I'll just try to get you to come to my side. It also seduces. Satan's not stupid. It rejects needed truth for a wanted lie. How many people have chosen safety and security over freedom? And here's the thing about lies. Lies cannot stand scrutiny, uh, but the truth can. So we don't need to fear what people say to us, think of us. Um, if you're a people pleaser like I am, then I, sometimes uh, maybe, maybe I don't speak up when I, when I should. It's like, well, I don't want to upset them. Really? We're seeing that kind of play out in our politics. Like, well, we don't want to say anything too bad about Iran. No, speak the truth. The truth can handle scrutiny. Lies cannot. And, you know, if you think our culture is hopeless, or maybe you've lost hope, the size of your sin is no barrier to God's salvation. So, I took probably the most notes on Martin, um, and a lot of this will, it'll, it'll, it'll leak out here and there. Um, this is one thing that won't leak out. As if you follow follow me on social media, and I know you do, because it's one of the most important things. It was my first Waffle House experience. And no, I'm not going to put it on, but I, 
I, they found out it was my first time, and uh, and and th that was like 13 bucks. That included tip. I mean, waffle, uh, raisin toast, hash browns, bacon, scrambled eggs, orange juice. Mmm. I'm just having a moment here. So I thought, okay, let me sneak a selfie. <laughs> Those aren't really duck lips, those are quail lips. I don't know, no idea. All right, the next speaker was James Coates. Um, uh, I, I think it, he, was, it, he was interesting. I honestly, I don't know if it was the jet lag. I didn't get a lot out of the guy. I was expecting something different. Anybody know who the guy is? He made international headlines um, for that. Um, he was jailed, uh, he's a Canadian pastor, uh, but he was jailed for refusing to shut his church down. And, uh, you know, well, I mean, Washington State was restrictive enough, but their rule was 15% of capacity was the limit. Um, and he politely said, yeah, no, <laughs> we're, we're going to stay open. Um, and so he was uh, arrested and, and jailed and detained for I forget how long, but he was finally released and almost all charges were dropped because they started realizing the Canadian government's like, yeah, we're kind of in a weak position here. Um, but he spoke on um, from Second Corinthians, but also Second Timothy two, uh, that talking about you know that we are a soldier of Christ and that. Uh, God's word is supremely sufficient, and we're called to be good servants. If you want to be a good servant, you need to have good doctrine. You need to know God's word and have it solid. So my apologies to Mr. Coates. Um, I think I understand maybe why he, he said nothing about his situation in Canada. So I think, I mean, that's why he got invited, but he didn't say anything about it. I would have maybe thought he would share, you know, well, how did God work in his life or in his church? I don't know. Um, but, uh, I mean, he was a good speaker. I just, you know, some are going to move you and some aren't. This guy <laughs> was awesome. Daryl Harrison, um, he is actually also connected with Grace Community Church, uh, John MacArthur's church. He gets the award for the longest topic title of anyone, The Spiritual Deception of Wokeness, a Postmortem on the Effects of Wokeness in the Church. This is one bright dude. I was looking up vocabulary left and right. Um, like when he talked about the ontological abyss, uh, it's like, huh? It's like, I'm not entirely sure what that is. So in talking about wokeness, first of all, he acknowledged there's no agreed upon definition. I mean, who can define what woke is? And it's a term that's been around. It used to basically mean you were awake to what was around you, but it's become something very different. And he said it, it focuses on the deconstruction and destabilization of other concepts, mainly absolute truth. Because you think about it, the folks that fall into that camp, they're not interested in truth. Certainly not absolute truth. And so they, what it, it, what they, their stated purpose, um, they talk about wanting to uh, destroy, you know, systemic this and that, and you know, the systems need to be replaced, and uh, kind of the whole defunding the police, because that's worked out super well. Um, so he continued, um, what the effects are in the church, an attempt to widen the narrow path to God. Because scripture is very clear that the path to God is, it's narrow. But the path to destruction is wide. Um, theological relativism. This is actually, we'll talk about this more later in future messages, but he's kind of quoting a, a pastor, unfortunately, that said, 
we need, in talking about foreign missions, he said, we need to convert to their truth, not convert them to ours. It's like, what? Now, have missionaries in past, the past, made the mistake of trying to change certain cultural things about another country? Yes, and we can see that being not successful. Um, and uh, I think if you want to see a really good way to handle that, you know, read some of Elizabeth Elliot's works on, you know, how, how they ended up working with the uh, Udani tribe and uh, also known as the Alka uh, Indians in uh, southern Ecuador, wasn't it? Subjective truth as reality, what you feel in fact, it would be, it's the only time I'm really tempted to slap anybody was when, is when they say, well, that's, you know, I need to live my truth. <laughs> your truth, your truth is going to get you killed. So it's the subjective thing, you know, I, what I feel is reality. No, what you feel is what you feel. Um, hopefully our emotions and feelings are based on reality. But uh, I had wonderful feelings of truth when I had that first Waffle House experience. Truly. Truly. You talk about ethnic tribalism. You think about it, one of, the, one of the most segregated institutions we have in the United States is the church. Black church, white church, Asian church. Why is that? He talked about envy from Thomas Sowell. Any of you read Thomas Sowell? I figured Tony had. <laughs> um, it, 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 he's got one of those minds that I'm, I'm envious of. But he said that the whole root of the social justice movement is envy. You have something I want. Covetousness. Not pointing over to my mom for any particular reason. But, you know, it's interesting, okay, so it's, it's been a long time joke in our family. My mom has said, why covet things? If you're going to break a commandment, just steal it, and then at least you have it. <laughs> but is it, what's crazy is that that joke has turned into a reality in our culture. People just taking stuff. They, they're taking things because they feel they deserve it. There's an entitlement there. Um, it's kind of like reparations. It's like, well, you know, I've been wronged, uh, so I'm going to make it right. This iPhone is going to make me feel right. Not, not when you start using it and realizing what an inferior piece of equipment it is, but it's okay, Nicole. Keep those kids in China working. This guy was phenomenal, uh, astronaut Colonel Jeffrey Williams. He was in the Army for many years. And I thought, oh, cool, an astronaut. He'll show some space pictures, which he did. This guy set the record uh, 524 something uh, days uh, on the International Space Station. Um, so he's been around. That must be a younger picture. Uh, he's been around for a while. I mean, he was on space shuttle flights. So he actually showed video from one of the space shuttle launches from his perspective. Um, he showed a lot of uh, pictures from when he was on the International Space Station. There's a video he closed with, and um, I'm going to try to see if I can uh, obtain it. But it's showing Earth from space at you know, all throughout different parts of the world, and it's fascinating. Um, I can't, I can't share in a in an uh, an effective way the stuff that he showed. It was amazing, but um, he focused on Psalm 111. <clears throat> what I did not expect from this guy. I mean, the guy's a genius. He was an engineer. Any engineering minds here? You, okay. Um, I respect engineers. Uh, I don't understand them. 
we need those minds though in our world. Um, so an engineer, but what I didn't expect was he was solid on his exposition of God's word. It was really phenomenal. Here's just the first couple of verses of Psalm 111. You can see why he picked it. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. I never really thought of verse 2 in that context that, you know, studying God's word, if we delight in his creation, we not only study his word, but we study those things. We study his creation. He listed creation, sustainment, provision, and providence that they all need to be understood through and by his work of redemption. It all, everything that he spoke about, he brought it back to the cross which I thought was really phenomenal. Genesis 1.1, he said, that's really when our faith begins. And John 1.1 is our faith is born, when we find out who Jesus Christ is, that he is the word. Here's one of the slides that he showed, it, not so much for the picture, but for the content there. Classical biblical presupp presupp presuppositions in science. One, rational and knowable ordering in creation. Two, precision in the ordering. Three, lawful contingency. So some of you are thinking, oh yeah, that's interesting. And some of you are like, huh? Um, but he points out from Colossians, in him, Jesus Christ, all things hold together. And Hebrews 1, 3, the latter half, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. God's word is important. It matters because it, it literally holds the universe together. <laughs> Sorry. This was called the Pride of Zeus Burger. Um, it's at a place called Mad Mike's, uh, which I ate at last year. And um, a, a Greek family own it. And this had gyro meat on top of the patty and feta cheese and oh, and tzatziki sauce. It was so delicious. And if you like onion rings, their onion rings are pretty good. Uh, Mike Johnson, congressman from Louisiana, was scheduled to speak at the pastor's gala. But uh, if you recall, he was supposed to speak on Wednesday. Tuesday, we found out he couldn't come. Remember what was going on that week? No, you don't. Um, that's when they booted uh, McCarthy out, so he was recalled to Washington, D.C., uh, so that he could vote. So they had Michael Ferris in his place. And Michael Ferris, I kind of vaguely, the name sounded familiar to me. How many of you know who Michael Ferris is? So you may not know the name, but you, you do know him. He was the president of the Alliance Defending Freedom for many years. He actually just stepped down a couple years ago. He is an attorney. Um, he lives in Washington State. Uh, he was born in Arkansas. We won't hold that against him. but. Um, but he has, uh, uh, as an attorney, he has argued before multiple state Supreme Courts. He has argued before the United States Supreme Court on two occasions. One was on a landmark decision on homeschooling. In fact, he started a, uh, a nonprofit that supported homes the right to homeschool, because when he started that, most states weren't, he said, when I spoke to the 50 attorneys general back in, was it the 80s, um, he said most of them said they did not think that homeschooling was legal in their state or they weren't sure. And he said, we've come a long way because now there's no question as to the legality of it. So they've made a lot of headway. Um, a case that he was most recently involved in, but his name I don't think got a lot of uh, press, is he was co-counsel uh, arguing on the Dobbs decision. So that was not long ago at all. So he's definitely pro-life. He said that he became pro-life when his wife was pregnant with the first of their 10 children. They're expecting their 30th grandchild and their first great-grandchild this Christmas. Um, so he's pro-life, <laughs> pro-something. Um, but he said he became pro-life when he went to Lamaze class and realized, you know, there's a life in there. 
This is not just a, a glob or a glump or uh, anything along those lines. So I took a lot of notes with him, not so much at the gala, I didn't take any notes, I just ate my food because that's what I was supposed to do. Um, but the whole idea of the Bridge Widman Center, it's uh, the first uh, church to have a mobile uh, ultrasound van in the United States. They now have two, and they're in New Jersey, so that's remarkable in and of itself. Um, if you know kind of the political climate in New Jersey. Um, Anyway, so that's what that gala event was, was for. We'll talk more about them at another time. Mike Johnson, again, Congressman, was supposed to speak Thursday morning, uh, fight like a Christian contending for the faith in an increasingly hostile culture, uh, but again, couldn't make it. So uh, Michael Ferris spoke again. And regarding the Dobbs decision, here's what he said. He said, Dobbs gave us the freedom to demand the humanity of the preborn. And he made an interesting statement, back to his being pro-life and when he kind of came to that, that point. Um, well, his whole thing on singing the right song, he didn't give a title, so I kind of made that up based on what he spoke on. Um, but his point was that the pro-life movement and the church have not always done an effective job in proclaiming pro-life. The old days of having a big, huge poster of an aborted baby in front of Planned Parenthood was not and it is not effective. How does that speak to, you know, the, the woman that is hopefully uh, grappling with that decision? It doesn't. It just turns them off. Um, and so, uh, let's see, do I have that on here? Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. But he said, look, here's, he said, here's what our goal needs to be moving forward. Because the fight is actually not close to being over. Um, in fact, if anything, it's, uh, he's, he warned Christians, by the way, we're gonna run late. We're already running late, my apologies in advance. So I'll try to talk more quickly. Um, if he doesn't want Christians to be complacent and think, well, okay, Roe v. Wade's been overturned, we're good to go. No, not at all, because now there's 50 battles to fight, state by state. Now there's many states that have already passed pro-life legislation. Um, our state is trying to get a constitutional amendment to uh, support the so-called right, which there isn't one, uh, to an abortion. Um, but he said, look, the goal is not just to reduce not just to get abortions banned, but to make abortion unthinkable. And that's a very different argument, isn't it? It's to say this is why abortion is wrong because God is a God of life. We haven't put Deuteronomy 32, 39 as a memory verse up on the wall, but we repeat it enough in here, we ought to know it by now. I am the Lord your God. I give life, I take away, I wound, I heal. Period. And any other argument, you can talk to me individually if you don't accept that. I just think that falls short. There's Mr. Ferris. So, singing the right song. How do we, and this isn't just about abortion, it's about how we present the gospel, how we present Christ. When you have a good song, he said, first of all, sing it sweetly. Have the right words and a good melody. <laughs> and we need to do that as we are, you know, the whole turn or burn kind of thing doesn't work with most people. Um, it doesn't mean we compromise or back away from proclaiming the truth, because look, if we don't, it, 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 really, it definitely does not mean that we don't talk about sin, we don't talk about hell. Because we as Christians need to let people know that those are two very real things. Because what is the point of proclaiming the good news if you don't tell people about the bad news? Because then it's just some fluffy, you know, well, okay, fine. Um, you want to go to heaven, I don't, want, I don't play harp, I find, I find it annoying. Um, but that's not what heaven is. So, 
Sing the song boldly. Sing the song faithfully. Don't give up. Trust in God. Trust in His Word, that Proverbs passage, that it will be proven true. You're not going to win everybody over. In fact, how many of us have ever won someone over for, to Christ? Zero. Because what, what is our job? To present the message. It's God's Holy Spirit that brings somebody to Christ, ultimately. Their decision to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So, on the abortion front, he said this was what was important. Uh, kind of their mantra, if you will, is help them see the baby. That's why the ultrasounds are so important. That mobile lab, four out of five women who get the ultrasound decide to not have an abortion. And they park those mobile labs right outside of Planned Parenthood. They do. Does not make Planned Parenthood happy. But, and the, the argument that people are thrown out now is, well, you only care about, care about the baby when it's in the womb. You know, what about those babies that are born into unloving families, into poor families, and it's like, we need to yell at the top of our lungs that we care about life from conception to death. We care about life, period, all life. See the baby, share the hope, save a life. There's more I could say about him. He recommended a book, so of course I had to get it. You'll hear more about this book later. It's called The Great Dissenter. It's not a Christian book. Um, and you're thinking, oh yeah, I, I love the story of John Marshall Harlan. Do you know who John Marshall Harlan is, attorney? <laughs> uh, John Marshall Harlan was on the Supreme Court for 37 years. The Plessy versus Ferguson case, which said separate but equal, he was the lone dissenter on that. In fact, he's considered the father of dissent because before that, the Supreme Court had a tendency to just kind of rubber stamp, and if you dissented, you didn't say anything about it. This man went through a lot of unpopular, <laughs> he was not a popular person, and yet he felt that he needed to speak the truth. So anyway, I felt obligated to buy another book. Uh, this guy, Phil Johnson, um, leaving the old life behind, such were some of you from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. He talked about social sin versus sexual sin, the noetic effect, noetic, excuse me, not noetic, that's a, that's a whole flood of definitions on that one, but noet, the noetic effect. Anyone know the noetic effect, what that is? You're absolutely right. Um, it's the idea that when we sin and we continue to stay in our sin, that we start kind of convincing ourselves that, well, what we're doing really isn't that bad, or it doesn't matter, or we start lying to ourselves. Um, so, in, in more under street vernacular, sin makes us stupid. So Ken Ham, uh, last two speakers, uh, how do you evangelize a culture that has changed its foundation? And oh, there, we made that point already. Good news requires bad news. Uh, he talked about uh, 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And he pointed out, it, I hadn't really thought about that, but it, both of those are addressed. Peter, when he talks to the Jews, how many came to Christ? thousands. Paul, later in the book of Acts, speaks to the Gentiles. Remember the tomb to the unknown God? Um, to the Greeks? And they look at him like, you're an idiot. What are you talking about? And I hadn't thought about this, but you look at the Jews, because what did they, what did they know? What did they believe? They believed in God. They believed in sin. They believed in death. There was no, it was a common language. They had a common foundation. So when Peter comes along and says, the missing link is Messiah, and it is Jesus of Nazareth. So that's why it was a stumbling block to the Jew, because they believed all that other stuff, but it's like, now you're asking me to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah? Whereas the Greeks, 
What was their opinion of God? Which one? <laughs> and sin. What sin? You know, do whatever you want. Do what feels good. And death, well, death was just, you know, it, it, it happens to everybody, but there's nothing significant. We can't do anything about it. There's nothing after it, so who cares? And so to them, the Savior is foolishness because there's no need. Why do you need one? What does a Savior save you from? The eternal consequence of sin. Well, if there's no sin and there's no God, then why do you need a Savior? Martin closed out with, you are the light of the world, um, kind of back to the gospel of identity. Yikes. It has become a cult. It's become a religion. Identity. But he said we need to deal with others according to the overflow of God's character, not the deficiency of our own. And that the world hated Jesus because he, when he shared who he was, it exposed who they were. Well, that's where I'm going to have to end things because uh, I'm about like halfway through because then I start looking at, you know, some of you guys have seen the ark, you've been there. Um, so I'll just have to figure out when to share some of those things at a later date. There, there's the ark. You can see Mrs. Noah right there with her cup of, cup of coffee. Oh, I did have one. Um, I'll get back to these later, some of the stuff that's in the ark. But I had one special thing for... I did put a, a, a warning in here. Oh yeah, they have a zoo. Oh, that's right, it's when I get to the, I went to the Creation Museum the same day that I went, because I've been to both before. Um, so this is the Creation Museum. And they go through the seven seas, which some of you are familiar with. But uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get into that later. The baby, the five foot model. It's, it's just stunning what they've done there. Um, but all these bugs. <laughs> Open your eyes, Teresa. <laughs> Teresa does not like butterflies. I know, isn't that crazy? They had hundreds of butterflies. Which bothers you more, those or those? Those. Or those? Or those? Oh, uh, there, let's go back to Moody. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for life. Thank you for loving us always and giving us everlasting life through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you in his name. Amen.